Ladies and gentlemen, my name is uh, Nick Hayden. I'm one of the current co-chairs of the Adult Education Interest Section, and I'll have that job until the end of tomorrow, I guess, and then we'll have a new leader coming in. Uh, in Chicago, Rob and I listened to what the Adult Education Interest Section wanted to hear in Atlanta. They told us they wanted to hear two things. They wanted to hear a panel on advocacy. Rob had that this morning at 9.30. They wanted to also hear a panel on the blended learning classroom and the ESL teacher. And that's what we're going to talk about now. In Chicago, I went to a tea with the, a distinguished Tesler. Uh, it was entitled Leadership in ELT. Uh, I was led by Rosa Aronson. Some of you probably know Rosa Aronson. She was our past executive director. Uh, she's now retired. But my opening remarks are going to be a truncated version of the wisdom she imparted in the 10 of us who attended her tea. Now, first thing she talked about, she says, what is leadership? She said, uh, leadership is the ability to envision and shape the future. And teachers certainly do that. She went on to say uh, leadership is the ability to see trends affecting the profession. And certainly, we're on the digital frontier, and that's a trend which is affecting this profession. Thirdly, she said, leadership is the ability to take action. She went on to ask the question, how can you develop and exercise leadership in your own context? She said, leadership is a skill that can be learned. It's context driven. And I'd like to add something here about this. Context driven means it's all about relationships. You have to accept risks if you're a leader. You have to promote sound policies if you're a leader. And you also have to advocate for your students. And in just a couple of minutes, I'll talk about instructional advocacy. Now, what about leadership in this organization, TESL? You can go and you can get the Leadership Development Certificate Program, where you talk about leadership in TESL. And there are a myriad of opportunities for leadership in this organization. For example, professional councils, committees, task force. If you're looking for a job, I'm going to have a job available at the end of Friday. Now, let me uh, talk to you for a minute about instructional advocacy and what leadership has to do with that. And the way I'm going to do that <coughs> is I'm going to relay to you a little story about Chicago when I was at the Chicago TESL conference. I was sitting having coffee, I think on the third day of the conference, looking at the agenda, I think I was waiting for a plenary speaker to come and I was just sitting enjoying some coffee. And a, here comes this young man, maybe 35 years old. He said, hi sir, I'm from India. And all of a sudden, my afterburners kicked in because I've got a severe case of wanderlust. He said, he's from India. Great. I want to hear this. He told me, he said, you look like you know what's going on. You look like you know the lay of the land. I said, well, I've been in this business a long time. I think I do. He said, I said, what's on your mind? He said, I'm discouraged that my program puts so little emphasis on English language teaching and allocates so few resources to the teachers. What's your recommendation, he asked me. He said, I want to lead. I want to be a leader. I want to do something about this. I want to fix it. You know what I told him? I told him, you lead. You take the initiative. You put that PowerPoint presentation together and make it persuasive and then knock on the administrator's door and make an appointment to go talk to the administrator. <clears throat> I went on to say instructional advocacy and change is slow, very, very slow, but you must be a leader and take the first step if it's ever going to change. Okay, so with that, we're going to go into our panel on the blended learning classroom in the ESL teacher.
Now I can tell you, I'm going to in introduce each one of these speakers and tell you what they're going to talk about, but I can tell you that the people sitting right over here <clears throat> are the thought leaders in this line of work. They set the standards that you and I follow. Um, so without further ado, let me introduce the speakers. The first speaker is Andrea Lipka. Andrea, if you could stand up. Andrea is a native Hungarian, is a PhD candidate in second language acquisition and instru instructional technology at the University of South Florida and English for Academic Purposes adjunct instructor at Hillsborough Community College. She serves as co-editor for the Tesla Intercultural Communication Intersection Newsletter. Um, and also editor for the Environmental Responsibility Professional Learning Network and a member of the Publishing Professional Council for TESL. Uh, her interests include developing online teacher training courses as well as implementing service learning and participatory digital research and instructional methods in multiple adult education programs. She will be talking about blended learning and the historical context where did this all start? And she'll also be giving uh, practical applications from community-based organizations and refugee programs. All right, thank you, Andrea. All right. Okay, Christine Bauer-Ramazani. Okay, our next speaker will be Christine Bauer-Ramazani. No, oh, no, no. Uh, she's a native German, is director of the English language programs, as well as a teacher and teacher trainer at St. Michael's College in Vermont. She integrates technology into teaching and learning. She's passionate about call. She has designed and taught online graduate courses for her college in TESL. She's the co-founder of the Electronic Village Online of TESL and chaired the call intersection of TESL. She received the D. Scott Enright Award for service. She has multiple publications and presentations, including book chapters, articles, international presentations, keynotes, technology, and strategic planning. All right, thank you. And Christine will be talking about integrating technology into the college in the IEP programs. All right, Dr. Sabai. Okay. Dr. Christine Sabai, professor at Notre Dame University, is an American who lives in Lebanon. Through her teaching, administrative post, and research, she keeps up with her interest in language teaching, assessment, education, and teacher training. An advocate of call and a certified online instructor trainer, she does educational consultancy, conducts workshops, publishes, and participates in conferences on the national, regional, and international level. She is a member of TESL, serving as the TESL interest, uh, Call Intersection Chair for 2018-2019. She is also an active contributor to national and international publications. Thank you, Christine. And Dr. Sabai will be talking about identifying the strengths and the weaknesses of blended learning, role responsibilities in teaching, learning, and assessing using, these, using this method. All right, Susie Lee is a senior lecturer and instructional designer at the Georgia Tech Language Institute. She teaches advanced level learning learners in the intensive English program. In the past years, her main focus has included developing online programming, programs including teacher training. Uh, Susie also provides faculty and staff and instructional technology solutions through training. She has over 13 years of experience in various programs in the U.S., Canada, the U.K., and South Korea. All right, thank you, Susie. Now, Susie will be providing the capstone presentation for this intercession. She will present two videos. One video will be of teachers talking about their perceptions of blended learning, and the second video will be about students 
telling us and giving us testimonials about how blended learning has affected their learning. So you can see without, without question, we have, a, we have some Tesla rock stars here in this line of work. So without further ado, I'd like to invite Andrea up to the stage for her presentation. So if it's just set up, yeah, it's just set up before, but now it's not set up. Welcome to my presentation. Uh, I will be talking about my experiences integrated blending learning um, with uh, refugee uh, language learners and pre-service teachers. Um, and I would like to start off by saying that there are uh, around 22, more than 22 million uh, refugees worldwide. And um, half of them are young adults who lack access to um, educational uh, opportunities. So I believe that it's, um, on us to provide them educational opportunities, and I think technology can uh, be a way to improve their uh, learning. Uh, in this presentation, I will provide an overview of uh, blending learning, and I will talk about some implementation issues, um, pros and cons, and I will provide an example of blended learning application um, from a community-based organization and refugee program that I had an opportunity to work with my pre-service teachers in an English language, uh, in an ESL course. Um, so before we delve into the presentation, I would like you to um, go to uh, menti.com, grab your phone and go to this website and type in your code um, and answer this question, what is blended learning uh, for you? So
and as well as learning online, not just like reading documents, but actual learning practice. Thank you. Anybody else? The same as what she said, but I, I really like to call it interactive learning because the students don't feel like they're learning interactively when they're just using paper and pencil. Thank you. Uh, I would say that it's uh, creating a digital space outside of the physical classroom so students can continue to learn um, at home. Thank you. So community building, I hear uh, learning uh, outside of the classroom. Thank you. And um, for some reason, this doesn't seem to work. Uh, you can see the question, but I can't. Um, so what are the uh, challenges uh, of blended learning? I know you can see it on your um, phone, but I am unable to project it on the screen. Some challenges, maybe some of you conducted blended learning activities. Yes. Yes, you need the microphone. I think that one of the challenges for English language learners is that they don't get the immediate feedback when they're working at home. Um, so that might be a big challenge. So more opportunities for, mm -hmm. for immediate feedback. Lack of access to digital resources. Especially for refugees, I think this is a, a probably something that we should consider, uh, lack of access to um, internet and lack of access to digital resources and maybe they might not even have a cell phone so s these are some things that you might like to consider with um, refugee uh, background English language learners and what are now some advantages oh I'm sorry Did oh you are, are you ready no okay um, I was just gonna say that our students who are parents or caregivers if they're doing um, you know taking care of people at home um, that's not always conducive to learning at home too Um, adjusting to the paradigm shift of actually learning with the interface of a computer or a mobile device. Thank you. That can pose some challenges, uh, especially with adult uh, uh, language learners with refugee background. Could, could privacy um, matters be an issue too, with mm -hmm. especially children? Privacy, thank you. And ethical issues, uh, right, with refugee background, uh, English language learners could be problematic. Okay, thank you. And let's talk about some advantages of blended learning. What are some advantages? Because we are all here thinking that we might like to implement it in our classroom. I think it could be a time saver if you're able to successfully do some learning objectives online and some face-to-face. -face. Time saver, thank you. I think it extends the classroom um, instruction and gives them more, pr more time to practice and, and in maybe even a less threatening environment at home or whatever. Thank you. Anybody else? Multiple modalities maybe could be also attractive, some language learners, right? And um, as, as you mentioned, uh, that it, it could connect the classroom to the community, it could build more opportunities. Uh, thank you. So this was a great example of how technology doesn't work. Uh, so. Um,
you might, might think that uh, there is a difference between online learning and blending, blended learning, um, but for instance, the enriched virtual uh, learning uh, model is almost totally online with few opportunities to uh, discuss face-to-face -face with um, between the teacher and the student. So we start to go into blurring the bound boundaries between online uh, uh, and face-to-face -face learning and how much, how much percentage should be online, how much percentage should be face-to-face. -face. Um, Dreambox Learn in 2016 provided a couple of um, uh, additional uh, models and uh, just to provide a brief overview, uh, the face-to-face -face, uh, model is the traditional, the closest to the traditional school structure where uh, one student um, is given in class additional online activities, um, such as an online quiz or an online video to improve um, um, his understanding or her understanding about a co a com content. content. Um, and the online driver, uh, the, the last uh, model is basically one student taking the whole class online and coming in once in a while to check in with the teacher uh, about his understanding. So you can see that these models um, are very just different in terms of um, how much access the student has online and how much uh, t um, access the student has to face-to-face -face classes. Um, some of the benefits uh, that you mentioned already uh, this learning anytime and anywhere uh, is expanded. Um, many of you mentioned preferred using preferred modes of communication, uh, text, uh, audio, right? Uh, many of our classes are very written text heavy. Um, so uh, online uh, blended learning can extend this multimedia uh, approach. Um, not many of you talked about the perceived low, low cost and uh, you have to be careful because it's not always um, the cheap, cheap, it's not always cheaper, um, especially when you talk about uh, uh, some uh, learning management systems, like when you try to integrate them. Um, and uh, Alston uh, et al. in 2013 mentioned the greater teaching flexibility. And um, this only works if you are teaching the same class. You have the opportunity to develop uh, video tutorials like I am doing currently in my grammar class. But this only works, uh, this time investment, if I will be teaching the same grammar class again using the same textbook. So again, um, these um, studies um, have a very positive outlook, but think about your realities. Are you teaching the same class again and again? I don't, unfortunately. And there are studies that um, uh, talk about improved academic uh, performance. Um, not necessarily in TESOL, and I will talk about briefly about those studies as well. Uh, some challenges, you pointed out the unfamiliarity with the technology. Perhaps this can be avoided with uh, tutoring um, or, or you know, um, creating a tutorial for students and teachers. Um, other studies um, point out the difficulty measuring the impact of learning. How do I know that they, what they learn is based on the blended learning approach that I'm using in the classroom? Um, inconsistent use of technology. Once you are blending uh, your classroom, you have to be consistent um, and you could then discuss how much and when, but you have to use it then some way consistently. Um, we, does, we did discuss that it does not necessarily lead in to improved academic performance, okay? Um, and then Hinkleman points out the reduced context for learning. I think uh, one of you pointed out that in home, the home environment is not necessarily <laughs> conducive when you are taking uh, care of a parent, uh, right, or you are helping a child to do his homework. Um, so the pedagogical implications, based on what I gathered from the research, uh, should consider, first of all, the learning context and the learning context in the classroom and the home-based learning context. Um, and also the available, what available user-friendly technology do we have? Um, can I use Voki? I think we had uh, one of my colleagues present on Voki, how she used Voki in her classroom, Powtoon, Audacity, Animoto. These are free, um, freely available software that you can uh, check out. And uh, the teaching presence. So just because I'm using technology, that doesn't mean I am not, I, I don't have to be there for my students. Um, can you give me an example of teaching presence? What does it mean in a blended classroom? How can I create a teaching present? Because for me, this was difficult. Yeah. Uh, I think um, one thing that might need to be um, 
my, my master's degree was almost all online. And mm -hmm. um, when one professor would, uh, at the start of every module, record himself introducing the lesson. And I really, it, it motivated me more because I felt his presence in the class rather than, you felt like there was actually humans involved in the learning process. So. Thank you. Anybody else? I think there was a, yeah. Uh, well, um, the, the fact that you feel the teacher is there as facilitator and is there to guide you, um, um, for me, it's uh, less daunting because you, you have this misconception that with blended learning, our job is not done or, or we lose our job with this, and it's not true. I think it might be very similar to what he said, sorry, if I'm repetitive. Thank you, that's, that's a good point. Like uh, there, there were studies done in uh, India where um, they used a trained teacher and an untrained teacher and there were differences in uh, students' academic performance. So this, this um, notion that the technology is a panacea it does not really exist. So we don't have to be afraid that our jobs will become obsolete because your role changes. So your position as a teacher, understanding that I will be guiding and not stage on the stage like I am now. Um, yeah, so the, the role of the student and the role of the, uh, the, the, the teacher in the process is very crucial. And also the support of your administration. If you're not having a supportive administration, it's very difficult for some of you to make changes. Um, so going back to TESOL, uh, I mentioned that it was, there were mixed results, um, but Garrett mentioned this uh, pedagogical uh, framework that, that blended learning should be framed as a pedagogical framework. Um, and he gives a couple of uh, 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 questions that we can lose. How do I integrate it um, into the syllabus? In which syllabus? What about my students' level? So everything that is in this, um, I, I guess, direct quote should, should be really food for thought. Um, and then uh, Thornbury um, provides 12 principles that we can think about how to integrate blended learning in the classroom, such as adaptivity, um, how do I allow my students to set their own learning paths and goals, like uh, making sure that I personalize the learning experience. The complexity of the language which is very important for English language learners. Input, output, noticing, scaffold, uh, scaffolding feedback, what kind of interaction do I facilitate in my classroom, authenticity, which is very maybe important for the grammar uh, learners. Um, and, and other issues that you need to consider when you are implementing uh, blended learning in your classroom. Um, and here is one example that um, I, um, I want to like focus at the end of my presentation. So I integrated uh, digital service learning um, in an ESOL class which was online and the purpose of the class was to provide uh, pre-service teacher, teachers um, access to English language learners which was a little bit difficult to accomplish because the whole course was online. So I felt like I had no control over the learning process and I felt like there is no accountability. Um, so what I did, I um, created a partnership with a community-based organization. Uh, they were serving at that time uh, 300 um, uh, uh, Hispanic uh, uh, refugee uh, background um, adult language learners. Um, and my, my students had my pre-service teachers were meeting uh, once a week face to face and they developed a participatory filmmaking project. So this could be a good example of using blended learning in your classroom. Um, yes, it was a lot of work, but I think it was worthwhile because I could observe my teachers teach and help them and provide immediate feedback as, as one of you pointed out that was missing. The feedback happened in the class. Um, my English language learners used Facebook and WhatsApp for communication and learning management uh, system. And my pre-service teachers, obviously, they were using Canvas, so the two systems were not communicated. But I had access to both systems and, and I could witness how learning happens. Um, and, and you can see that in this picture, I have my pre-service teachers getting together to plan the participatory filmmaking project uh, at the library. I just stopped by to take a picture of them. Um, and these were the, the steps that I designed the project for them. So I assessed the, the community partner needs, the teacher's needs, and my course objectives. And I correlated these objectives within this project that took six weeks to accomplish. Um, and these were the steps, so they had to uh, identify the, the, 
community uh, partner needs um, and then come up with a topic. So the pre-service teachers work together with the English language learners. Um, then they had to do a scripting project. They had to write it out in uh, words what they plan to do in the movie. Then they did a storyboarding. I have examples, but unfortunately due to lack of time, I can't delve into that deeper. They collected data, and again, uh, they used uh, their cell phones. Um, good question, uh, obviously. When I went to the organization, there were no computers. Uh, so I had to be creative and borrowed one computer from my university, and they used one computer, but I told every student, use your cell phones, and they were proficient, they were using their cell phone anyway, so they had a lot of pictures, videos to share, so that worked out nicely, and then they digitized all this content using iMovie. And all the discussions happen on WhatsApp and on Facebook between the teachers and the English language learners. The sharing happened on the, the class website, but they also, uh, to make it more relevant to the community, they did a, um, a, a community film screening, so they invited members of the Mexican embassy, local community, um, uh, law enforcement officials, po politicians um, uh, to visit the, um, the organization. Um, these were the aims of the project, and again, because it was a service learning, I was very careful to address everyone's needs. It wasn't about me blending, uh, learning, uh, 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 blending uh, the technology for my students, but blending the technology for all parties. Um, so this was the project, and again, I know we don't have time, so we can't watch the movie, but I am happy to share the link with you. Um, and at the end, um, the project was able to deliver everyone's, to meet everyone's needs. Um, and especially for my, for my teachers, what I loved uh, uh, that they were shifting their um, preconceived ideas about what is an English language learner, what is the parent of an English language learner. So it, it, it promoted a culture of acceptance. Yes, thank you. So the teachers were able to not just see, I am the teacher, you are the student relationship, but really build a community. And I think this quote um, um, you know, nicely summarizes that they were basically learning from each other. They, they created a community of, of practice. But this was only possible because I integrated a longer term project. So it was six weeks to, um, to design and create the, the digital story, the, the community filmmaking project. Um, and they were able to interact with each other. And during this process, they had a lot of reflections uh, integrated within their assignments. So it wasn't just co-teaching and working with the English language learners to um, um, design the, the filmmaking project, but they had to teach these this learners um, vocabulary and uh, various concepts. Um, and the other example, this is not my example, uh, it comes from Opening Universities for Refugees. Um, it's a charity registered in the UK uh, that was started by um, this lecturer. Um, and uh, what she's doing currently, this is a newer organization, she's developing an online mentorship program uh, between uh, the teachers in um, Indonesia and um, other places, and they meet weekly via Skype to kind of um, provide each other professional development. So um, in conclusion, uh, blending learning just by these two examples, uh, in my opinion, can foster the development of alternative ways of knowing, of thinking, and expression of identities in not just academic environments, but community-based learning environments that tend to promote uncritical conformity with current linguistic and cultural values that fail to recognize students' life experiences and cultural competencies, which Moll et al. define as funds of knowledge. Uh, blending learning can also empower students to document and reflect on social uh, issues relevant to them. This is what happened with my pre-service teachers, um, and, and they were able to adopt multiple communication modes, experiment with mm -hmm. teaching practices in ways that they were not able to do it in my online course. Um, and, and to my learners, uh, to my English language learners, they were able to craft their stories, include multiple perspectives, and also reflect on their learning experiences. Um, for my pre-service teachers, a deeper understanding of how English language learners orchestrate semiotic resources 
can assist them in designing blending learning curricula to leverage diversity and inclusion in the classroom, transcend academic and home borders, and strategically engage students in L2 discourse communities. And this is uh, my list of selected references, and I am happy to address questions, or perhaps we address questions at the end of the... Yeah, we'll have, uh, Thank you. Uh, Mike, sure, yes, I am happy to do that. Mm. Oh, I, I don't know what happened. Yes, I will, yes. Mm -hmm. While Christine is setting up, um, I just want to let you know we have um, up here on the old-fashioned paper easel a link to our wiki, which ha will have all the speakers' contact information as well as their presentations if they have shared them with us. So if you just go to the call is2019.pbworks.com site and you click on the link to this presentation, you'll get a table with all of the um, presenters and their contact information. So just wanted to let you know about that. Okay, so I'm ready. And I will have a lot of resources on my website, um, uh, on my um, PowerPoint here on the slideshow. So feel free to take a shot of the QR code reader with, scan, with your scanner, or note down the bit.ly link below. Um, I have the references there. I have a copy of the slideshow there. And the slideshow is full of links to um, applications and uh, different websites, so might be useful to do that. So I will be talking about uh, what I do with blended learning in the intensive English program at St. Michael's College, um, where I typically teach, and I'm going to teach in a week, um, an oral skills course at the high intermediate level and there will be an example of, um, if we get to it, a video of a project that my students did there using blended learning. Okay, um, I have it at the end again, so uh, if you don't get a chance to do it now, uh, we can do it later. Okay. So I think um, we have a premise going here um, that technology permeates all learning and teaching. Would you agree with that statement? Uh, we used to say in the call interest section, which is uh, where I come from, uh, we need to integrate technology into learning and teaching. And yes, we still need to do that. But I think these days it permeates everything, not just um, learning and teaching in the electronic village or in the call IS, it's everywhere uh, in your adult, any adult education context. So um, I thought I'd start with that kind of premise. And um, so there are some questions then, how do we best integrate the technology for uh, blended learning and teaching? And um, Andrea already referred to a few frameworks or theory and research, so I will be talking about that a little bit more. And then uh, what tools do we use in order to, to do this effectively? And probably, um, could I have a show of hands please? Who among you uses um, a learning management system? Okay, who does not? Uh-huh, just two, okay, so two. Um, and talk to me afterwards because, um, and I will be referring to learning management systems, so um, are, you, are you clear about what they are? A learning management system is an all-encompassing uh, web space where students discuss and upload, okay. Like Blackboard, yes, okay. So, um, Learning management systems, and I do have a few examples of them um, on the next slide, but uh, here's another premise. Um, 
in order to integrate technology effectively for blended learning, uh, we as teachers need to know how to take full advantage of those digital platforms. And I think that is a must. Um, and I'm finding it in my, with my own teachers um, being a must. Uh, they want to know how to do it, and if they don't, they want to learn. So it is no longer a should. Uh, it is pretty much a must. Okay, we also uh, should think about using flipped learning and extending our classroom that was mentioned earlier, extending our classroom beyond the four walls that we have. And, you know, I found that my students over the weekend would lose their English, um, you know, from Friday to Monday. And so these days, uh, that no longer happens because I have built in ways to get them inter interacting and engaged over the weekend. Uh, and that is typically through flipped learning. Okay, so uh, that also means that teachers need to learn uh, additional repertoire of how to do that. Okay, that includes the tools, but not just the tools. Uh, there is a lot more than just the tools. Uh, and very importantly, teachers need to learn how to scaffold that kind of learning for inside and outside the classroom. Uh, and lastly, uh, they need to be able to create assessment instruments in order to measure whether the teaching and the learning has been successful or not. So here are some of the examples of learning management systems that I'm sure you're familiar with, okay? Um, any up there that you're not familiar with? Oh, Genzabar, yeah, it's just a, another one. It's uh, proprietary. Um, I remember when St. Michael's College was looking at uh, different proprietary um, learning management systems. This was one uh, that came up to, to give a presentation, and they're, st they're still in business. I, not, I, they're not that popular, I guess, but um, it is just one more, okay? Uh, the ones that we use in the Electronic Village Online are the ones on the right side, okay, because they're free and we typically use only free tools. Uh, so you may be familiar with those more. Okay, so now moving into the framework that underlies uh, or should underlie something that we do with technology. and. Um, I'm going to talk about two frameworks that I have found useful in the last uh, quite a few years now in integrating technology into what I do. Uh, so on the left side, we've got the four strands model by Nation and McAllister, that is Paul Nation. And what it says is, well, there has to be meaning-focused input and uh, the tools that I will be showing you provide that meaningful input then there has to be meaning-focused output, and again, tools should be used, technology tools should be used to facilitate that. Language-focused learning, um, again, how do we do that? What tools should we be using for that? And fluency development, okay? And what Nation McAllister say is that there needs to be, to be a balance of the four of those. And so when I build, when I scaffold the activities that my students do, and Andrea had a project and uh, referred to project-based learning. I'm a big proponent of project-based learning, and so I am very mindful of this balance of the four different inputs, outputs, language learning, and fluency development. Um, the references are at the bottom, but again, uh, when you go to that link, I have a whole list of references. Okay, on the right side, we have um, a way to think about technology and where technology fits in. In the middle, you have what is called the sweet spot, um, putting all three types of knowledge together. So there is content knowledge that the teacher, of course, should have. Then there is pedagogical knowledge, and there is technology knowledge, okay? So putting all three together is what Mishra and, and Kohler in 2006 uh, started talking about, and um, it is, and, and they have been uh, writing more about it since then. Uh, it is a popular uh, model. So we're going to look at some tools, and I'm going to use those four strands to build uh, the background for those tools. 
So the first one is meaning focused input for uh, reading and listening, okay, the two input modes. Okay, so um, who here is using is extensive reading? Mm -hmm, just two, three, four, five, six. Okay, hands are going up slowly. <laughs> okay, um, so you may be doing that with just uh, regular paperback books, but uh, there are, and those are links. When you go to those links, uh, you will find um, web pages where you can do extensive reading with your students, okay? Just in case you don't have a lot of resources available. Uh, then uh, you do literature maybe, uh, books, stories, okay? Again, when you go to that link, those are all from my, my own web pages. So on the right side, you've got uh, my 7,000, I don't know, 7,000 plus links um, compendium and uh, there are lots of tools there, okay? Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about ESL Bits. Is anybody familiar with that? Okay, uh, it is a website that offers lots of authentic readings. Uh, for example, uh, novels like The Great Gatsby, but then there are also um, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, uh, you know, novels. They're unsimplified, so upper levels, okay? Um, Dream Reader, on the other hand, um, also has uh, some unsimplified materials, but uh, at two different speeds. So students can listen and read at two different speeds, okay? Slower and faster, so that's an advantage. And uh, Dream Reader um, is more for the intermediate level, and does have uh, some activities associated with the, the websites, such as quizzes. Um, Nuzella, are you familiar with Nuzella? Okay, so that was not designed for ESL so much, but can very well be used for ESL because there are thousands of articles that can be differentiated for different levels, and that is, of course, the beauty for, uh, for us. Uh, we can differentiate according to the levels and the needs of the learners in our classroom. They can be, it's the same content, just you can put in which levels, and the learners themselves can put in which levels they would like to read at, so. Weed works, read works, okay, thank you, okay. Uh, Nuzella is freely available. Um, if you pay for it, you get uh, a little bit of a learning management system that goes with it for um, testing. Okay, um, I'm going to move on to listening. So these are some uh, resources resources that I'm sure you use uh, in your classrooms, news, etc. When I have the students, my students in the oral skills class. Um, go home on Friday, they have an assignment from me uh, to go to those sources uh, right here, English Learning, uh, which is audio, it's Voice of America audio, uh, at reduced speed without subtitles. And I emphasize without subtitles. Uh, and there is a little bit controversy about that because you know we used to hear they should have subtitles, no. Uh, the latest research, and I've got the research uh, at the bottom there, um, indicates that subtitles, as, as a non-native speaker myself, I always felt drawn to the reading of the subtitles rather than the listening. So if this is a, re a listening activity, which it is in my case, I want them to listen without subtitles and build their proficiency in listening just the way I did it long ago, okay? And it does, it does work. At first, uh, you know, it's difficult, and then it gets easier as they progress. And same thing with uh, learning English video um, and Voice of America TV. So all of those are without subtitles, those links. Okay, uh, meaning-focused output in writing and speaking. Um, I'm sure all of you have done projects like the ones that you see there. Uh, for speaking, uh, you probably do uh, debates, presentations, are quite popular, um, maybe uh, role plays, doing a little bit of drama, okay? So we will be looking at some uh, tech tools to deliver those. 
written products, okay? I'm sure you do some of those things, like book reviews. My students have to do book reviews, tests and quizzes, of course. Mine have to do vocabulary logs over the weekend on those listenings that they had to do. Um, and then, as far as technology products go, you could have just a slideshow or presentation, or longer term, a uh, photo essay or a digital story or um, what have you. Okay, so here are the tools that I have used and put together with links for you um, to deliver all of those products. So for example, um, I'm just gonna pick a few VoiceThread. Is anybody familiar with VoiceThread? Okay, so uh, students uh, can, it's like a threaded discussion, but w it, you, the students could upload PowerPoints to narrate a story. You can then also provide your own feedback there, and other learners can provide feedback. So it's good for peer interaction, uh, peer reviews, uh, et cetera. Um, let's see, virtual reality um, has become pretty popular. Uh, so uh, Google, Google's uh, virtual reality tour creator is a really fun one uh, to integrate as a project. So I'm not gonna go into any more of those, um, but uh, here are some more tools for writing and speaking, um, if you'd like to take a look. But as I said, you know, even if you don't get the bit.ly here, it's all from the PowerPoint at the beginning. Okay, language-focused learning. So what tools do you use to do that? I'm sure you use electronic dictionaries, yes? I have one teacher. Um, who still uses paper dictionaries and brings them into the classroom. Um, and I have tried to abuse him of that um, because now I'm the director of the program. <laughs> so, um, but, um, you know, it, that's what he feels comfort most, most comfortable with. Okay, if it works, okay, it works. Um, he has been learning how to do other things, so at some point in time, I will show, show him how to use the electronic dictionaries. Is anybody familiar with Hypothesis? It's an annotating tool that is wonderful. So any web page, you can annotate, and you can then also have a discussion with your students in Hypothesis. For example, you can add uh, comments there, or you can ask your students, uh, what is the main idea of this paragraph, okay? Uh, and it's a free tool. It is really great. Any web page you can pull into this and do that kind of annotating with. Um, we talked about uh, Quizlet um, uh, in another session. I, I saw uh, Quizlet Live. Who has not used Quizlet Live? Uh -huh, so everybody has, you use it, okay? And if you have not, you should. It's much more than just Quizlet, which is flashcards, but Quizlet Live is provides a game-based environment to practice vocabulary before you then can give a quiz. I mean, that's what typically what I do. Um, sticky notes, graphic organizers, and their text-to-speech programs. So there's a lot more, okay? All right, um, fluency development. That is what it's all about. You have to have all the tools together and practice. Okay, so this is what my students did. They um, had to scaffold, well, I scaffold, scaffolded the project for them uh, with technology. What they had to do was um, take a, there was a topic in the book called, um, what was it, Sleep Habits. Okay, um, not the most exciting topic, but I turned it into an exciting topic because the students had to interview five faculty, five staff, and five students uh, collaboratively. They had to post um, in uh, a Google page what they did, and they had to research it first. Okay, so this was group-based. Uh, that had to be shared. It was vetted by me. I posted copious comments, and then we went on to the next one. Okay, electronic dictionaries were used, and they had to produce Google Slides in the end. So there were two kinds of, um, well, you see this, the template here 
that I have for what they needed to post in the Google Doc, and I evaluated this. Okay, so I had to provide two kinds of scaffolds for technology and for language. And this project I thought was gonna be fairly fast, but it wasn't. Uh, it took a good week and a half of work, um, meeting three times a week. Uh, so those are some of the things that I used, some of the technology scaffolds. The students had to learn how to use them. Um, so they, all the instructions um, were in a Google Doc in the classroom. I showed them some of the instructions. Some of the work we did in the classroom and a lot of it we did outside the classroom. So the students would then come to class having this downloaded, having put in, as you see on the right, uh, some of the survey questions from the Google Doc answered. Um, and then we would work on those. I would get the results and they would, we would go over how they worded the survey questions because if you've ever done a survey, you know students have trouble uh, creating good survey questions. And they, the survey questions were then put into Poll Everywhere, which is very similar to Menti, uh, where you ask uh, your, uh, the person you're interviewing questions and it records them. And then on top of it, uh, it puts the results into um, what you see here on the left side, uh, puts them into either a Google slide or a PowerPoint slide uh, automatically. It shows graphs as to how many people uh, answered it this way and you know, which, which choices uh, this, the uh, interviewees uh, chose. So um, I think we have uh, 40, 49 seconds to listen to that. We are IEP students and yeah. are learning about these topics. Okay. And we would like to ask you five questions about the last three okay. topics. Okay, sounds good. We are going to compare the results and make a presentation in class. Okay. So I'll be there. Can I pick a lot Yes, Thank absolutely. You. Um, please do you get on the Weekdays, uh, about six. Five to six or six to seven? Six to seven. How many hours of sleep do you get on the weekend? Eight. Okay, so that's uh, the presentation. And you get the idea. So it took a while for them to get all this together. We had to work on presentation uh, mode, also how to present something, how to present data. Uh, I mean, there was so much language-focused work in there and so much content it was wonderful to work with. And uh, the students felt challenged in terms of the technology and the language, so uh, they loved this project. So I can only encourage you to use blended learning inside and outside the classroom. Thank you. Menti, that was, uh, yeah. Uh, Andrea's tool. Okay, I'm look, doing things a bit differently. My focus basic, it's not a bit differently, but it's not practical. It's more talking about the strength and the weaknesses and the role responsibilities in the teaching, learning, and assessing um, environment. So basically, we could say I'm like concluding the session because a lot of the benefits and the challenges were discussed at the beginning. But I'm looking at it from a different point of view in the sense that if we look at the idea of blended, Blended, as has been said, has become a given. It's a must because everybody walks around with technology on them. 
right? So it has become um, a fact that we, we are forced to include technology into our teaching learning environment. So it's become a necessity for us to include this. And we're mixing in the e-learning and the face-to-face -face learning concept. Even if we are not aware that we are doing it, the fact that our students are walking around with this, so we are, we are accommodating to be able to meet all the personal learning um, needs as such. So the idea is when we blend, the idea of blending, what are we blending? We are blending content, we're blending um, uh, um, a scale of learning or a scale of teaching or a scale of assessment. We're looking at technology, we're blending in technology, we're blending in the types of learning spaces. So the concept is to blend. Blend what? It's up to us. But the idea is we, we think that blending empowers. We want to think about that idea as an empowerment tool or an empowerment concept or an empowerment space for us to work in. And that's how we've looked at it. Er, ever since you know, the idea has come along, it has become a buzzword. We love buzzwords in the world of education. But the idea is how successful are these buzzwords? Okay, we need to, we, we, we are realizing that it, it is empowering us, but we need to understand that it's not always the case. That is not always the case. So my purpose, my first purpose is to look at the strengths and weaknesses. I try to number them, okay? And then talk about the idea of, with blended learning, what accountability is there? Our teachers are being are responsible for the teaching spaces, for the learning environment, for the assessing. But at the same time, we are expecting our students to become responsible for their own learning. So to what extent are we able to make our students responsible for their own learning? And the second purpose is to look at the role responsibilities, the teachers, the students, and the actual roles that happen in a teaching um, and learning and assessment um, environment. I came up with 29 spaces. Um, strengths, 29 strengths. Um, I'm not quoting theory, I'm not quoting references, but I read a lot. Some of the uh, references have already been mentioned. Um, I'm very much pro-theory and referencing, but at the bottom line is, we need to take that information and put it into action, okay? So I came up with 29, 29 strengths. You may agree or disagree, I don't know, but th those are the ones that I came up with. And then we'll see how many weaknesses I came up with. Basically the concept, ideally it empowers both the teacher and students to improve learning outcomes. Fantastic statement, okay? So let's, let's look at that as my first big strength. So it addresses needs. Yes, it does address needs. It, in, it ensures that the learners are engaged and driving their individual um, learning experience. So what are we doing as instructors? We are catering to learning needs. We're helping students in their learning, so we're allowing self-pacing to happen for the slow or the quick, for the quick, quick learners. In other words, well, what are we trying to do? We're trying to reduce stress. Stress so that we can entice and, and give them an environment that produces um, learning, that produces um, satisfaction, that helps them retain information. We're breaking down traditional walls of teaching. Sometimes that's good, sometimes that's bad. And we're creating more interactive, and that word was used today, the lady left but she was talking about, I don't like the word blended, I prefer the word interactive, remember? So the idea is yes, we're bringing in um, an environment where we're making it more interactive, but at the same, the same time, not only are we making it interactive, but we're also increasing chances of collaboration. So some students can work well individually, some students work well in collaborative um, situations. So the idea is we can bring in collaboration. We're also blending learning spaces, you know, and you can give them as many titles as you want. You can, you know, the flip. You flip the classroom, you flip the lab, you sl flip the station, you flip the material, you flip the syllabus, you flip, et cetera, et cetera. We, we, f we play around with the idea of blending the learning space. At the same time, we can blend the type of learning, learning in the classroom, learning online, 
you know, extend the learning to the home. So we're talking about blending um, learning spaces and blending how the learning is to happen. So it, may, it does not necessarily mean it's happening in a form, formal space. It could also be happening in an informal learning space. Um, our teaching methods are changing. So this is something that is positive because we know the, ver the more variety you have in a classroom, right, the more you can, ha that can help to keep the student on task. So anytime you have change, we can call it a blend. Anytime you bring in new things, we could also call that a blend. So you bring in a bit of technology, you bring in a bit of, you know, there's nothing wrong with the paper pencil in a classroom. Um, so you're, you're, you're changing um, an environment where teaching is happening. Um, you're enabling students to work with the teacher on an individual basis, but at the same time, you're also encouraging team teaching. So you could have team teaching, you can have team learning, you're blending activities, so that's another positive. You're blending activities and you're also blending assessment types. Traditional assessment types, and, well, traditional assessment and alternative um, assessments. By the same token, you're blending the types of students. So you can also blend uh, students and their learning styles. You could also blend students, high achievers, low achievers, and you could have them use the technology to assist in this blend, or you can choose to keep it traditional, or some will use the technology, some will not. So the idea is you're blending also in an environment where the types of students and the types of learning styles can be brought in to be used in a blended manner in different learning um, spaces. Time efficiency was another one. You can improve time efficiency, but guess what? It may be efficiency, but it may also be um, a challenge, okay? Students may be working at their own pace, but the own pace may not necessarily mean that the outcome is positive. But we look at it as an, uh, in a positive framework that yes, we've improved time efficiency. We've provided along the way technology that could be helpful for them. So what other technology can I use to help me, help tutor me or help me do assignments or help me uh, work in that environment? So the idea is that students are not so teacher dependent, Te students are not so space dependent. So that allows us to happen also in a blended environment. Um, versus having the face-to-face -face physical only environment, okay? We've added on the idea of collaboration. So not only do you have students collaborating together, but you could also have students collaborating with teachers at different times. So di whenever the needs are there, sometimes it could be a group need, it could be an individual need. Um, you could also bring in the, 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 the parents into the um, blended environment. So you also are giving parents a shared responsibility. And having parents involved in your little model of blended learning can have better support for the student. So that could also, they're not in the classroom, they could be at home, so you have the parent involvement that could also add to the, um, the whole equation. So communication flow may be better, the control over the learning process may be there um, to, to help the student move forward. Um, that, the next one was also mentioned, the extended learning time beyond the classroom day. So you're, flex, you're becoming more flexible in the actual time frame in which the learning is happening. So yes, it may be self-paced, or it may be induced learning, it's okay, you don't finish it at home. Uh, in the classroom, you can finish it at home. So the idea of having the students become more and more satisfied in the outcomes or the attempts of learning that is happening. Information may be retained better also in a blended environment because of the way you plan your tasks. The way you plan your tasks will also help um, uh, help students retain information in a way that maybe if they were just retaining information in a classroom and then had to go home and do some homework, you would find that the information was not retained as effectively. Data, student data um, also seems to be um, better in a blended learning environment. And you also are creating spaces where students can become more creative. You're engaging them 
into um, deeper learning, so it's not just shallow learning. You're allowing them, because of the blend, to dig and dwell deeper into subject matter, thus giving teachers more responsibility in the planning of the blended environment. The planning of the blended environment becomes something that f teachers need to focus on, so that's more time consuming, but at the same time, it provides students with more learning autonomy, with more autonomy to become more responsible. So the idea of the changing of roles. With blended learning, we're changing roles. There is learning taking place in a classroom, so teachers are responsible. By the same token, students are responsible. When, you, when learning becomes online, teachers are responsible to ensure that this learning that is taking place online will allow students to become responsible for the learning process online, okay? So the idea of changes in role in, an un, on an, uh, in a blended environment, what happens physically, what happens uh, virtually. Um, and what you find is that the completion of the task becomes the focus and not what does the teacher approve or what does the teacher not approve. Do I have the okay to go on to the next step? So the focus becomes more on, I need to determine whether or not the task is complete um, or I am satisfied with what I have done so far to be able to then share with, with others. So, the, so the, the focus on completing the task becomes uh, key, becomes key. Moreover, the thinking and the brainstorming before the completing of the task becomes a focus. So how do I answer? Let me think about it, let me plan it before I actually answer and before I finally submit this, whether it's submitting it in class or submitting it online. So the idea of how do I use the technology to help me do this becomes something that, that the students need to explore in the brainstorming to plan um, how to answer the actual um, task at hand. So you see what's happening in a blended environment, we're changing the whole teaching, learning, um, uh, and assessing uh, focus. Another thing is, it supports, and I too am a, am a key um, advocate to project-based learning, and I do believe that if we teach students to identify a problem to try and solve the problem and then have them do a project to show this, this also helps them acquire new responsibilities where they become responsible, responsible learn, learners. So modifying their learning focus is a, is a plus when it comes to blended, um, blended learning. It also enables us to teach large groups and as we said, Prior, if you teach large groups, you are also looking at minimizing costs. So that's another thing that is positive that schools and universities love, okay? And the work assignment, the work assignment and the focus on the students who need guidance, you are able to blend that in because you can differentiate the type of work that students are expected to do and you are helping them acquire this ability to do this in a blended, in a blended um, environment. So learning becomes more engaged in a blending environment because learning be, should become fun. So the concept is in blended learning, we, wanna, we want uh, learners to look at the idea of how learning can become fun by introducing the different tools. In introducing the different tools, I mean, we're simplifying the equation introduce new tools, motivate students, engage students, get them to be more interactive, so you can bring in interactive elements, gamification, all the digital devices that are available that Christine um, was sharing. Now the weaknesses, okay? So we talked a lot of positive. Now my weaknesses, four more minutes, my weaknesses to me are more important than the strengths. Okay, because these weaknesses, I think, are very important weaknesses. It is not scientifically proven that blended learning is better. So when we embrace blended learning as a new buzzword or a new way, we need to understand to what degree is it really enhancing learning. It's time consuming, 
It's difficult for students who are not able to manage it. It's not for all students because they cannot work in different spaces and they cannot work with different methods. So the if, a, if you have students that are inability to self-guide themselves or direct themselves or to combine online with face-to-face -face, or are not able to inquire and dig deep, you have a problem. You have a problem. How about the inability to connect with their mentors? I see them, I don't see them, maybe I see them when I need them or when they determine they need me. Okay, so this question of this instability of not knowing who is there, who is out there to actually mentor me and help and guide and facilitate my learning is a big weakness. And I think this is very important. Engagement. How do we know that students actually know how to engage? We assume they're being engaged. We assume that they're reaching an endpoint, but is that engagement the maximum that um, we can get from a student? Um, so that's another thing. The engagement may be a challenge, whether physically or virtually. It also increases the fact that maybe they don't know how to use the technology and that becomes a challenge in itself. How about the overwork? Teachers are overworked because of the, 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 the planning. And let's think about the students. Are they overworked with the learning? What we expect of them to do the learn in, in terms of learning? and what they have to do to show us that they are actually learning. So the cognitive load is another big issue. And the plagiarism. I live in a world where plagiarism is a norm. I live in the Middle East, and they think they're smart. They think they're smart. They, they don't have English fluency, but they give you a perfect paper that has perfect fluency. Automatically, you don't, need to, you don't, need to, you don't even need a tool to check for plagiarism, okay? So the idea of, with blended learning, we're increasing the idea of plagiarism is okay if they don't reference, okay, or they don't uh, put in the information in the right way. So the idea of do we just take anything? So the idea of sources and credibility. And sometimes we need to also realize that students at d uh, of different ages cannot become responsible learners for activities that we assume they should be responsible for. So age, the issue of age, when do we blend and how much blending do we do with what type of student and what age, um, what age. So the idea of responsibilities, I have seven responsibilities. If teachers and students are responsible, we need to think of the responsibility in a teaching environment. We, think we need to think of the students, so our responsibility towards the students and our responsibility towards assessing them the way we, are, we need to assess them for learning. We need to think of the student from the student point of view. The student is assessing how he or she is being taught, how he or she is being expected to learn, how he how he feels he is learning or she feels he is learning and how the assessment is being done to feel is this appropriate the way that I see my learning uh, taking place. So the idea is we need to look at the whole blended learning environment and the responsibility we have as educators in planning that, that whole blended environment. So we need to be proactive, but we need to understand what does proactive mean from whose point of view. We need to become people who develop we d we're developing learning, but we don't see the feedback immediately. Because I know when I go into a classroom, I'm, I'm teaching, I'm collaborating with my students, I'm giving and taking, I may change as I'm teaching. That doesn't happen if I've given them guidance and they have to go home or they have to figure out on their own. So there's no way of me giving and taking with them um, to modify things. So I'm developing, they're developing, I'm delivering, they're delivering, so we have different role responsibilities. Thus, when we assess, we're benchmarking, but benchmarking against what? Do we know that we're actually benchmarking in the right way to actually say that learning has happened? Or are we benchmarking to, on a standard that that standard we have no control over in the making of that? So what I basically want to conclude with we need to monitor engagement. When we blend, we need to monitor engagement, whether it's a space, whether it's content, whether it's the student, whether it's the teacher, because the outcome measure for learning is what is reporting whether or not there is success 
or no success. And I believe the weaknesses are what we need to pay close attention to and not the positivity of, of that outcome. Thank you. That was my conclusion. Okay, thanks for sitting through the full panel session. Um, my part is gonna be showing you how teachers and students have reacted to the blended learning approach. Um, I work at Georgia Tech Language Institute and we are actually very lucky to have a lot of technology resources available. And if you remember from Nick's introduction of me, um, my main job at Georgia Tech is to create um, online courses and to develop other online resources for students as well. And I also work heavily with our LMS. And so in my world, blended learning and online learning is a must and I love it. But by going through a process of interviewing some other faculty who have a wide range of different experiences with technology and different students, it was really interesting to see the different perspectives. Um, so I'm gonna start off with so I'm gonna skip the intro really quick. Um, but I'm gonna start off with the instructor's video and I basically asked them these four questions um, and we're gonna to get to see how they responded to it. The second video I'm gonna show you um, is an interview with seven students and they don't really understand the word blended learning. If you go to them and say, how was your blended learning experience? They kind of look at you funny. And so instead of using that word for the students, I said, how was your experience with technology? And that's kind of how I carried through the interviews. Okay, so let's go straight ahead to the videos. Oops. Are they supposed to play through here? Okay, hold on. Let me try this full screen. They're not sure. Uh huh. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Oops. There we go. So should I use? Maybe I should use. Um, yeah. It's video media. PLC media. Thing? No, that's not cool. So play and then function F7? No, play, you have to like go like that and mm -hmm. get the F7 to play. So that's what you do, control F7 or function F7. There we go, sorry about that. Okay, there we go, yay. I think. Well, I usually teach reading and writing um, the most, so I guess the most common uh, purpose that I've used it for is for writing, collaboration, and assessment. Sometimes I assess and assess the work that they do as a final product, and sometimes they just collaborate as a learning process. And for that, they might write and post on a blog or use cloud collaborations to work on something together or just um, respond on a discussion or forums type uh, thing. I use a blending approach on a daily basis in my classroom, um, but in my writing classroom, I've used the blended approach often. Um, we're in a computer lab and we have a, a program that we use to control uh, the students' computers. Um, so we can obviously, if there's an assessment, see um, everybody's screen uh, and make sure nobody's uh, you know using a resource that is not permitted but the way I use it on a daily basis is actually to blast um, content to them so in the writing class um, we look at a lot of different models and break things down into small steps and I'm able to make sure that um, they all have in front of them the same exact thing that that I have um, and I can use a clicker too as I walk around the room to advance um, a slide. Um, so in terms of speaking, for example, um, 
I'm able to not only type that feedback for them very quickly, I voice text it to them in apps, but I'm also able to um, give that oral feedback so that they can have the pronunciation. Where at other times, it, I would have to do so many different things in order to make that happen. Um, I can do it really quickly. I can even do that as I'm walking across campus in my free kind of spare time. So it's, it's advantageous for me and also for uh, students, I think. So for blended learning, mainly I've used the LMS that we have here and we've changed the LMS recently. So more than one kind of LMS. I have also used cell phones and other technology that I've been exposed to. Um, but definitely the LMS has been the tool I've used the most. Um, I've used the LMS in all kinds of ways for assessment, um, sharing, like discussion, various tools of the LMS in many different ways, delivering information, um, having students collaborate, different kinds of things like that. I would say I've used it most for creating opportunities for communication between my students, ways for them to share their opinions with others, um, and also playing games. I've used cell phones a lot for playing games in class. I kind of just want cell phones to be something that students realize that they can enhance learning. I think sometimes we see them as this evil thing in the classroom and I'm trying to just embrace it, you know, as much as possible. So yeah, it can just create a more lively classroom, especially with the games um, and getting students together. many benefits uh, to blended learning. I think as far as the younger population, you definitely get students who are uh, more energetic about the, um, about the class because if you're asking them to use their, their smartphones um, in collaboration with what, something that they're doing, they definitely tend to be more um, energetic. So I think um, the energy level, and the enthusiasm in class has been um, quite responsive when it comes to blended learning and using um, different types of technology in class. Oh, the benefits are it's just an extra layer of learning. Yeah, it's uh, something beside the textbook or handouts that I bring in. I think uh, to use uh, blended learning is valuable because all the learners are, di you know, every learner is different from each other. And if I don't hit, you know, if the video doesn't hit one student, it will hit another student. And it's just uh, makes the, the learning experience more rich. Truly, I think the benefit is for the teacher and the learner. For the teacher, I think blended learning really pushes you to think about teaching and learning in a very different way. So, for example, the more I use the LMS, the more I find that my concepts of the, the ways that I can assess and the ways I can deliver information are really expanded. I think of ways to do it that I, I never would have thought of before because I know such a possibility exists or that I can cause it to exist. So I always look at using any kind of blended learning or any kind of technology as sort of like expanding the pathways in my own brain for how I can help learners facilitate them in arriving at certain understandings in more creative ways and a lot of times more effective ways I think. So I have definitely encountered um, some learning curves while incorporating um, technology and other aspects into the classroom. Um, one thing could be possibly when the technology goes down and there are internet problems and what to do in that moment. And, and honestly, I might feel a little frazzled or, or not know what to do. So there are learning curves on what to do in the appropriate situations. Uh, some students don't like collaboration and they definitely don't like sharing their work. Um, 
they don't like to publicly be critiqued on their work even if it's really good um, they and I think often blended learning lends itself to that um, more than like older students that were good with technology maybe students from some cultures that weren't as comfortable with technology we also had a large group of students at one point that didn't have access to a device which really surprised all of us and it was kind of like we'd all been using this technology and we expected students to have a device and then this big group came and we kind of had to rethink the way we did things. I think it is the future. I think the future is upon us and I think more and more people want to be able to hear things, see things, do things, assess their own learning their own understanding and not be tied to that being in only one physical place. I don't think that means that they don't want a face-to-face -face experience. What I think is that they want the balance. They want other ways to assess and they want to know that their face-to-face -face teachers are connected to those ways. And I think the two need to work together to produce the best experience possible. I think the future of blended learning uh, is bright. Um, in fact, I see the, the blend uh, going much more in the direction of uh, technology cent centered. So I'm really excited about the future of blended um, classrooms and where technology will be five, ten years from now. Um, I see a lot of benefits for both teachers and students. I see a few learning curves, but nothing that we can't overcome. But um, I think it's just going to make the classroom a lot more exciting. Was the volume loud enough for you guys? So I'm sure a lot of what you heard here resonates with some of the things that you've been feeling. Oh, just before I start the student part. Um, how do you guys feel about that? Are a lot of things similar with your situation? Yeah. But I think at the end of the day, like what I felt after doing these interviews, I mean, it, it was just about a little less than 10 minutes, but I actually did interviews for about four hours. And at the end of the day, it really felt like there was this very positive vibe amongst the teachers nowadays. And again, like a lot of these teachers, they have very different exposure to technology, uh, but whatever situation they were in, they were trying to embrace it and really um, take it to the next level as much as they could. All right, so this is kind of the finale. Like, what do our students actually think about all this? We're putting in all this effort. Do they actually appreciate it? Um, and is it affecting their learning in a positive way? So we're going to check out what they're going to see, and it's a little bit shorter than the earlier one we saw. I love to use technology, even in classes. It's gonna be better. That way they transfer or deliver the information. It's not just the traditional way, which is the old people get tired of using that. Could be beneficial, but I don't think it's, uh, it's to work or practical for the new people or the new generation, because they use to, to deal with technology more than with the uh, like whiteboard and get the information just in one place. When they go outside, they cannot reach it, so it's not going to be accessible. I do like to learn English uh, with more methods than only um, using one sense. Because when you have like media you can get, you have programs, then you can not only listen, but you can read at the same time. So I'm a really visual person, so I need more than one thing to learn. If I only read, it's going to be like really hard for me to take some knowledge of this part of uh, the studies that I'm doing. So I like uh, uh, learning with technology um, because I think uh, it's a good complement for my classes. I can prepare myself watching videos or listening to the radio. And uh, there are many apps that I like to assess for um, uh, learning English better and I think that uh, they are easy and fun.
Well, it's shame on me if I said I had I have t difficulty with technology because I'm a computer science student. But we have a website uh, in my school. Um, I I had problem how to how to uh, upload uh, my files uh, um, inside it. So this is my problem. In some cases, uh, when I found a really good information that I want to use, they ask me to pay for, for this info. They only show you part of the information, and to get the whole thing, you have to pay, or you have to make a like, arrangement for one year and that. So I think this is the difficult part. Um, now it's too much apps. Sometimes it's hard for me to choose which one is is better or is uh, appropriate for me. I cannot really ask questions during um, watching videos, so it means I cannot interact with the speaker of the video. So that's that could be one difficulty using uh, technology when I'm learning English. And sometimes I feel boring. I feel bored, like just watching the video. Not in the it's not in a class, so it's kind of different um, learning um, way. So that could be the difficulties. For example, uh, when I'm studying less, uh, when I'm studying something like listening. In English, um, I can listen the words and I can pronounce the word exactly what how it sounds. So that helped me to improve my listening and I improve my English every every time when I when I when I use these programs. Uh, yeah, it helps me to learn faster uh, because it uh, the technology has many sources. For example, uh, I always watch movies, so I learned how uh, some expression uh, to say, and also it helps me with uh, listening. And uh, I uh, I always listen uh, to the music, uh, to the podcast when I come to my uh, to my school. So uh, my listening and my speaking uh, have been improved by technology. I also want to share a very uh, wonderful experience about using technology uh, in a class. Uh, I remember one of mm, my project, uh, our several classmates um, as a group, a little group, were firstly were, we searched the uh, topic related information online and uh, watch some video and that and discuss mm -hmm. and use the uh, like the PPT uh, uh, this software to to do <laughs> a presentation uh, that's very mm, uh, enjoyable and helpful make me uh, more want to um, engage in it to improve myself more than if I use the traditional way but it's more depend on the person if the person wants to work hard to improve on themselves, it's not dependent on the technology. Very important final message, right? So hopefully, you know, this gave you some idea about, oh, let me completely shut this off. This gave you a little bit of idea of what the students are thinking and how we can incorporate some of the concerns they had. It was quite interesting because we always think, Blended learning, it's engaging and you know it's it's exciting. And one of the students said it was boring. And it's really about how you decide to actually blend the technology, the video app, or whatever you're gonna do, so that it really suits what the learners are trying to achieve. And it's not really taking over what you could do in a more interactive way in class. So really balancing all of that out, I think is really important. So I hope you enjoyed um, that last, last segment. I am working and living just a few minutes away from here. So if you need some last tips for where to eat in Atlanta before you go, come talk to me. Um, I'm just gonna give you my final um, contact here. So just in case you need to email me for more questions um, or just 
share your experience with blended learning, that would be awesome. I'm also a part of the Video PLN, so anything related with video, uh, you can reach out to us and we could add you to our mailing list. Thank you so much. We have about five minutes left. Does anyone, does anyone have any questions they'd like to ask any of the panelists? You have one? Okay. Um, this question is for Susie. Which, um, uh, I guess, app or website did you use to animate um, the woman who didn't want to be featured? I'm just curious. That was a really good idea. Oh, thank you. So it's Powtoon. Um, but you could use Go Animate or Movely. All of those work really well. I use Powtoon all the time because we bought a subscription for it. So since we're paying for it, I might as well use that. Um, but it's really easy. If you could create a pretty good PowerPoint slide with some animation, you could do Powtoon really easily as well. Does anyone else have any other questions they'd like to ask the panelists? What are you going to do with the information, with the data? <laughs> um, with the data? Uh, that's interesting. I, you know, again, like I mainly create online courses that are fully automated, and so my research and data collection has, have always been in that area. Uh, but after doing this, it would be interesting to see if some of the methods that we do in our program are actually effective, because I really didn't expect reactions like it's boring or, you know, things like that. Um, and so it would be interesting to see if what we're doing is working. Yes. So the, the online courses you create, I, I presume they're asynchronous? And they, so they're automated? Yes, so they are asynchronous. Um, okay. Now, the, we have some MOOCs, and the MOOCs are fully asynchronous. I mean, they pretty much run on autopilot. Uh, but we do have other online courses that we provide for teacher training and for um, graduate uh, research writing. And those ones have some synchronous components to it. So there are meeting times or opportunities where students could kind of get together and talk to the um, professor online um, in a synchronous way. So we do try to mix it up depending on the body of students. Like with MOOCs, we have thousands taking it at the same time. So doing anything synchronous will be impossible. Any further questions? Yes. Uh, in my context, we're looking at blended learning as a way to accommodate learners who can't get to class. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if there's any literature you could point to, any research on, on how that works, and, and also a range of of users who, who may not have a lot of school experience, um, and so they'd have the tech experience because we'd help them with that initially, but how that works. That's actually one of our struggles. Um, you know, we've, we found that uh, the location of Georgia Tech is amazing because it's in Midtown, but when you're not living in Midtown and you have to deal with traffic, parking tickets, you know, all of that stuff, it becomes a hassle, and I don't know if you've noticed, but Atlanta does not have the best public transportation system. And so um, that's actually a struggle that we're kind of going through. Uh, but if you reach out to me by email, um, we could definitely continue this dialogue. Yes, that's a very important thing that Susie just said right there. If any of you have any questions that you'd like to follow up on, I'm sure each one of these panelists would love to communicate with you. Just email them at their email. It should be in the book, in the program book and I'm sure they'll get back with you and tell you anything you want to know. Thank you. So with that, I think we'll conclude now. I'd like to thank our panelists once again, and I'd also like to thank Jenny and the crew over here on the side for orchestrating everything. And uh, have a safe trip back to your hometown. <laughs>